the broad topic here is mobility, but maybe it should be more immobility. If you look out on uh, Rue de la Loire, um, every day it's packed. Brussels traffic is, uh, is uh, exemplary in, in how bad it is. Um, there's got to be something better. I think we all know that in the, in the distant future, we'll all be driving autonomous cars or sitting in them, not driving them. But getting from here to there is, is going to be a, a, a long and bumpy road. Um, so um, we want to know, you know what is going to take us there. What are the challenges today in the world of mobility as you see them? I think we are currently in a... Um uh, we, see we see certain developments. Uh, we see the development of uh, number one is uh, urbanization. Uh, it's getting more packed in the cities, traffic jams, uh, finding an affordable parking uh, slot um, makes it much more challenging if car is really a suitable topic still for somebody who's living uh, in downtown. Um, second part is the increase of the environmental awareness. It's not just the governments who are forcing or pushing this topic. I think also um, people themselves become more conscious about what is their impact in environment. Um, topic number three is the topic of connectivity, uh, not between just devices and devices and cars, but also like how to get efficient from A to B. Um, the intermodal transportation between various, not just cars for six maybe, but also public transport, how they interact with each other. And last but not least, it's obviously the sharing economy. It's um, a, mind, a shift in mindset. People start coming from the stage of owning something, going to sharing. And I think that's uh, something which, which drives us as a company also quite a lot. And sharing is where, I think in the near term, cars in the digital world cross over because digital technology has really enabled a lot of what's going into car sharing. How many people have actually used car sharing? Are people familiar with it? Okay, so decent number. Um, I was actually interested to learn that Sixt is involved in it. I had had the impression that Sixt was just rental cars, but you're deeply involved with the drive now, which is with BMW. Um, how is that fitting into the picture and the, the, the you know, car sharing as a model? I'm glad you asked. This question. Um, yes, six is involved. Um, maybe all of you have seen here in Brussels and other cities uh, around Europe uh, drive now. It's a joint venture uh, with the BMW Group uh, and ourselves since a couple of years, five years approximately. And car sharing is booming. Uh, the registered numbers of uh, uh, is increasing every day, and we see quite interesting figures actually. 20% uh, of the fleet is containing of electric vehicles. Um, if you take maybe very positive examples when municipalities are very strict. Um, let's take Copenhagen or Amsterdam, for instance. Um, they told the car sharing providers, doesn't matter if it is us or other providers, that the fleet should contain 100% um, electric cars. And by doing so, um, in the last years, we created 300,000 initial contacts of people using for the first time electric mobility. And I think this is something really special, which we uh, would like to highlight also because the, the hurdle to go into a, let's say, car dealer shop, even though everybody's talking about electric um, transportation, the, the hurdle to go to a dealer, Tesla or whatever, and, and ask them, like, listen, can I get a test ride? is quite high for the normal. Um, but just jumping in a car sharing, I think it's super easy from going to A to B. And if you have this first experience with an electric car, I don't know if you have driven an electric car so far. I haven't. In fact, I, I totally agree. I've, I've walked by Tesla dealerships and with my kids and thought, oh, let's go test drive a Tesla at some point, but we've never gotten around to it. But uh, yeah, if I could just, uh, you know, car share uh, an electric car, that would be a cool experience. Yeah. So that's, that's a, a topic which, which is, yeah, let's say, hot. But on the other hand, it's, there are also very practical things. Um, there are various studies, uh, academic studies um, of various scholars, um, who tell us that if you have one car sharing, car is replacing approximately at least three normal cars which are parked or driven or not driven actually in the city center. And I think there is a huge potential uh, to also clean up um, the, the uh, emission which is produced nowadays and it could get better uh, by uh, implementing much more car sharing options. And is car sharing actually a good business? I mean, it, here in Brussels it started 
uh, that Cambio was a municipal project, and now there's Zipcar, there's you know, Drive Now, there are others. But is there actual money in car sharing? Yes, due to the fact that we as a company, we go into business models. I think every other company should do similar things that you will, on the long run, you will make profit out of it. Um, I think it's important that munis uh, municipalities and cities and governments support certain things. In Germany, a uh, new law is just announced um, to open up more parking spaces for car sharing options, mm -hmm. uh, which is very positive. Um, but yes, there is certainly a business and the numbers are speaking for themselves. We are close to one million registered um, travelers so far. Um, you mentioned before about the, the car sharing cars replacing cars on the road. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, that might be good. But from the perspective of car makers, uh, they're scared by this. Um, so how, you know, how can car makers be viewing car sharing, the shared economy, and eventually, I mean, I guess they're looking towards um, the future where you know, autonomous cars can move on their own from one person to another. But are, are car makers worried about car sharing? It's a question you should ask the car market, uh, makers. But what I believe is, and I think that's also the, the positive uh, cooperation we have, uh, or, or in general, what we realize in the, in the entire car sharing project, that it's a new way um, how to get people involved with your product. And um, that's, that's one um, very positive uh, factor. And McKinsey's study uh, showed recently that they expect in 2030 there will be 10 million additional car sharing cars worldwide, additionally uh, to nowadays. And I think that those figures are speaking for themselves. Was it challenging to get people over the idea of, I mean, with a rental car, you know it's been cleaned between users, but, you know, just getting people to adopt to car sharing, adapt to car sharing. Has, was that a challenge? I think there's, again, this, this shift in paradigm from owning a car, your own car, where you're really keen on and you keep it clean maybe and you expect that it is clean, to you share something. If you share something, it's like a shared flat, you know, it's maybe not always perfectly clean, but the, it's, not, it's not about anymore like it's yours. It's more about I want to get efficient and also cost efficient from A to B. And maybe then it's okay that there are maybe little scratches left and right, and I accept that because it's not about the car, but about the transportation at the moment. And has, I mean, my sense is there's been a shift that the early car sharing were sort of the cars that companies wanted to get rid of or, you know, sort of bottom of the line. But you, for example, you offer some pretty nice high-end cars. Um, is that an effort to just draw more people in? Is, I mean, does it make it more appealing to people? Or you know, is it just there's more money in that? It's, it's basically that you, give, uh, you provide cars or mobility solutions for specific needs and requirements. So um, let's say the example, sunny weekend, you want to go out. Convertible suits perfect at that moment. Imagine you're living in Bavaria or Munich and you want to go out for skiing. Maybe a bigger car is more suitable in that specific moment and you're much more flexible if you, if you have this kind of rarity which is offered. So for sex, I mean, I would imagine there must have been some consideration of cannibalizing your market. I mean, you're a car rental company or you, you also do fleet management, things like that. But I mean, in the past, I would have rented a car. Now, I rent many fewer cars, but I make many small purchases, essentially, of you know, a, a, a car sharing car. But you know, just balancing the economics, how do you work through that? You offer, or we at Sixth, we have the belief that we offer mobility from one minute to several years. As you mentioned, on the one hand side, we provide the classic company cars uh, for, for leasing, but on the other hand, the car sharing. And I think it's really like, what are the people looking for and there we see a shift and the shift goes that they expect also to, to have car sharing in your portfolio as well as company cars because both is requested not just by our B2C customers but also more and more uh, from B2C side uh, who want to offer their employees the right fit. And so how does a, a, a company if they're giving out for example company cars now are they going to give out you know, time sharing? 
on cars or? When, yeah, you have, of course, as many know, the classic uh, concept of giving a company car out. Um, we started working on last year uh, on a project uh, together with Boston Consulting Group, um, developing a mobility budget. It's a topic which is already known in the European market. Uh, let's say the Benelux, they are much more ahead uh, in those kind uh, develop, uh, of developments. Um, but it's a budget which you give to your employees and you can use various means of transportation, renting a car, e-hailing, car sharing. So for, a, for, the, for the certain specific need you have, you find the right spot. And I think this is something, this will be um, also more interest more will become more and more interesting for many other companies um, that say offer the right solution but it, it's not a one fit uh, one fit size all uh, solution but it's you know it's an add on so that's, that's the way where it will go i would assume do you think uh, any sense on how employees will uh, react to that i mean i people i know who have uh, company cars love take them on the weekend and uh, you know go on vacation and the company doesn't really know what they're doing. So if the company is managing a budget, is the feeling that that gives the company more control? No, I think with the first users we have now, and we have very positive experiences, um, they're very happy about this product and we don't see this data protection topic. We, we covered it obviously um, proper, but the, the, the company will never track or can't track actually where to go. They will simply get yeah, we see that you spend money on something, but no details uh, about that. But another very interesting thing is that um, I'm approached often by, by fleet managers um, and, and, and other colleagues and we're saying, like, why should I give away my car? It's, maybe it's not suitable for me. And then I always give the, the idea, like, listen, look back to the time when you selected the last time your company car. Um, there are certain things uh, which you picked up, you know, you want to drive on the German Autobahn, so it needs to drive fast. Um, then you have kids, you want to go to on vacation, so I need a station wagon. So if you have certain spots you look on, and with this in mind, you, you select a car. So it's a, it's a maximum car you get, you choose. But if you're really honest, I personally believe that in 80-85% of the cases, you're just traveling your 15 miles, 15 kilometers to work, from work, home, and how do you travel? Stop and go traffic alone and therefore you need a big station wagon. So wouldn't it be wiser maybe to size down a little bit, take a smaller car, uh, maybe even an electric car, uh, which could be supported by the company, and then get on top a mobility budget, which gives you like more mobility worldwide. So this is, I think, also an interesting fact. Mm -hmm. And in terms of coming back to this transition you know, towards uh, self-driving cars, uh, more electric cars, is um, the world of, of, of um, car sharing, where you've got much higher utilization and cars are moving around more, is it providing data that, that's going to be valuable in sort of stepping towards autonomous driving? I think the data is certainly valuable. I have, we have heard this uh, quite a lot um, uh, from our speeches before, um, uh, before us. Um, yeah, these are steps, I think, certainly in the way of autonomous driving. Um, but again, this is more a topic I think the car makers mm -hmm. are interested in currently. Yeah. Um, so, this, uh, is so you're not in, 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 in fights yet over, over the data being generated by the cars? Or, I mean, do you, you must collect a lot of data about your own cars. Sure, but that's, I think everybody who's providing cars collects yeah. data at a certain instance. And, and with the car sharing, there are different models of like the stations or the cars that move around. Is that, is that a big challenge in figuring out how to do this? Um, you know, where the it, cars are parked in one place, or you go to your car? Yeah, I think that's maybe for the explanation. You have two kind of models of car sharing. Uh, one share, uh, model is that it's station-based, so you pick it up and you return it to the same destination, more or less, a bit like rental. Um, and the free-floating, so the drive now, uh, as mentioned, um, it's a free-floating system, so within a city area you can um, drop the car wherever you want. You should stick to the rules, obviously, um, which are set. Um, nonetheless, I think that's the surprising fact, or that's, that's the challenge we are facing, but that's the interesting fact as well, that the cars, they handle themselves. 
that, that should be the point. And then car sharing is working. If you don't have to interfere, to, that we have to drive them at certain spots. Now the people who are using them, they drive them there where other people are, expect them to stand. And is um, managing a fleet of cars that's out in the city, is that a particular challenge? I mean, you're used to managing fleets where the cars always come back to you. Um, or is this the kind of thing where the connectivity of the car allows you to identify problems and you know, get to the cars? Exactly. That's a mm -hmm. valid point you're making. Uh, the good thing is, within a certain set area, you always can reach out to your cars. Um, the good fact is, due to the fact that they don't have to be cleaned after every little journey, um, that makes them run on them by themselves. But once in a while, they come back to the garage, we check them, we clean them completely, um, so that we will make sure. And two options, either they're automatically in the area where the garage is, mm -hmm. or we take them back at a certain uh, time spot. Are you, are you noticing any... Um discernible national trends in how people use car sharing, or is it, is it really kind of universal? I think car sharing is, I would say, universal. Mm -hmm. I think that there are certain, um, as mentioned before, that there are certain countries which are more open to new mobility solutions, um, UK, Benelux, and that some countries are still a bit more conservative, also the companies, what they offer their employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I imagine, for example, I know in... Uh, you know, Germany, of all, you know, people love their cars. It's, uh, uh, but in Berlin, you know, car sharing is really taking off, isn't it? It's just a very different culture. Definitely. I had a nice uh, talk with Clark during lunch, and uh, he told me, like, I uh, told him, like, I'm from Six and stuff. He was like, oh, yeah, you're in the, the car sharing, right? And uh, I got rid of my car due to this, um, uh, due to driving, and, and, and the other providers which are in Berlin present. And uh, this is, like, the proven case uh, yeah. that I'm coming up with. But, yeah. yeah, no, I'm... I've never gotten around to buying a car, and uh, <laughs> so you're I'm a big user. Proof of the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm um, going to test drive multiple models. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that. Um, have there been any big surprises just in in developing the model? I mean, was the uptake faster than you expected, or were there hurdles uh, that you've encountered? No, the uptake was uh, was very good. Obviously, when you start a new business, there are always things which you don't expect. Um, yeah, maybe there uh, a, f a story I heard recently, which is quite nice. Um, there was a holiday, uh, one bank holiday, uh, during the week or at the end of the week. Um, so what happened? Everybody took off this one two days and to went on a little trip. And so the people took the cars and they all drive, on, I think, on a Thursday to the airport. So all cars suddenly were not in town anymore; they were at the airport. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's, yeah, these are the little challenges. Uh, so we didn't expect that everybody, that it was so common already for everybody. Okay, I can use the car also to drive to the airport. Mm -hmm. Same here in Brussels, by the way. Uh, but yeah, if bank copy days occur, oh, could be used for that as well, yeah. And through trends like that, you, you are able to develop products like one-way driving or like specials with the airport? I mean, you target marketing? Yeah, there are certainly certain um, special products. Same for rent a car as well. Um, also for the car sharing or e-hailing, and we try um, um, to to get their new connections as well, mm -hmm. um, and that we that we offer their suitable products uh, for our customers. Do you have a sense like w what percent of your users own a car? I mean, how much is it people you know who don't own a car and just use this, and then people who want to go to a party and you know will take a taxi home? I've seen figures that um, approximately 50% of the drive now users do have. Uh, an own car, but 50% doesn't. So it's not there's not this specific type of user. So I would have thought in the beginning, okay, it's a very young crowd between 18 and 25. But actually, it's not true. Our biggest age group is between 30 and 39. So that's uh, was surprising to see. All right, I think we're running out of time, um, but uh, interested to see how this all develops. It's definitely uh, you know. As we started out, you know, so much of the digital economy is dematerialized, but it's uh, interesting to see the new business models where the uh, online world is enabling real changes in the physical world, and this is clearly one of those. Thank so, you, Dan. Thanks so much.